Hello everyone, welcome to uh, lecture 48. So, here I am going to look at the atomistic picture of one of the properties you know uh, uh, and you know so, so to, to, to impress upon you how the dynamics actually evolve uh, you know from an atomic scale essentially. And you know so, so although the atomistic uh, you know reasons for dynamics may change from property to property. The, the overall structure of them is going to remain similar, right. Uh, now, let me start this lecture. So, uh, so before this, right, so in the last class, we were actually looking at, uh, you know, some small signal measurements. We said small signal measurements are directly used to detect, I mean, measure the properties, right. So, uh, even whether they are linear, nonlinear, does not matter. If I do a small signal measurement, I should be able to measure the properties. Right. Uh, so, and then we we went to uh, uh, a complex notation. We said, you know, any property can be expressed. Uh, you know, any property. Let's let's start with thermodynamic properties. Right. So, so that's that's uh, something that I didn't explicitly mention in the last class. But let's start with thermodynamic properties. Any thermodynamic property can be, you know, is not. You know, you don't have real ideal systems where. Uh, uh, things just uh, materials just store energy, right? So I don't have an ideal capacitor. I don't have an ideal, uh, uh, you know, piezoelectric material where entire electrical energy is converted to mechanical energy or vice versa. So, so this this non-ideality is captured in the form of uh, uh, you know the uh, writing this uh, property as a real part and as a complex uh, you know quantity where there is a real part and an imaginary part. The imaginary part tells us about losses, but we will see I mean so we have already seen that the imaginary part of capacitance relates to conductance right. So, the imaginary part is the dissipative uh, you know property whereas the real part is the conservative property right. So, so and then you know so you have one uh, you know description where I, I say that the real part describes the conservative or energy storage, the imaginary part describes the energy dissipation uh, and so, so we, we are going to move towards a scenario where we want to uh, see uh, you know uh, look at the atomistic dynamics of what constitutes a real part, what constitutes an imaginary part and see how they are uh, you know they, they are related right. So, so because it is essentially one measurement gives me both uh, properties right. So, so somehow there should be some relation between these right. So, so in terms of dynamics ok. So, so let us let us look at the, the dynamics of one of these properties which is uh, dielectric constant ok. So, now let me start. Uh, uh, you know this lecture by actually giving you a, a fact right. So, now if I look at the epsilon which is the dielectric constant epsilon r the relative dielectric constant this is the relative dielectric constant of a material called hafnium right and I ask you the question what is the relative dielectric constant of hafnium right. Then you know there can be multiple answers. At what frequency are you measuring the relative dielectric constant of half near? If I measure this you know using light or you know at a frequency of 10 power 15 hertz which is the frequency of light this number is actually quite small it is about 4 or something or 2 or 4 something like that it is actually very small ok. Whereas, if I measure it at a frequency of something like uh, uh, 10 kilohertz or less than 1 megahertz let us say right. So, omega so I am looking at omega right. Uh, so, so how am I measuring epsilon? I am measuring epsilon through small signal measurement right. So, so that is at the back of my mind and so in a small signal measurement if you if you observed carefully the omega is something that I am fixing. I am doing it at one frequency this measurement ok. So, if I fix the omega to be 10 power 15 hertz now it is another matter that at 10 power 15 hertz I cannot do any electrical measurements, but let us just you know throw our imaginations wild and let us say if I can measure epsilon r you know using some sort of a small signal measurement at 10 power 15 hertz you know so I will have or I, I know I can do these measurements through some other way I can measure refractive index and then take a, a, a square of that should be should give me uh, the, the epsilon r ok. So, so I have ways of measuring uh, you know epsilon r right whereas if I do that uh, you know uh, at uh, less than 1 megahertz my refractive index is about 19 to 30 I can I mean depending on which phase this hafnia is in is it amorphous is it uh, uh, you know crystalline you know so, so I can measure anywhere between 19 and 30 and epsilon r is a dimension less quantity. So, it is just a number right. So, this 
you know so in these frequencies hafnia is used as what is called a high k dielectric right so in transistors right so so i have uh, a mosfet right so where i have silicon right so i have uh, this is going to be a source this is going to be drain both of them are p type let us say I have an n type silicon. So, then I have a gate oxide and on the top I have what is called a gate which is a metal. Okay. So, now this is the huge silicon substrate. Now, I can control the surface of silicon right. So, so this is this is the most useful part of the transistor which is the surface of silicon right. So, so, so this part let us say I can control that whether there is charge in this part or no charge in this part whether there is free charge in this part or no free charge in this part by applying a gate bias right. So, so I can uh, so, so the nature of carriers in the channel depend on gate bias that I apply and gate dielectric right. Now, if I use a gate oxide or gate dielectric which has you know so, so typically silicon oxide has a dielectric constant of you know less than 10 uh, I, I do not remember the number of silicon oxide, but yeah so, so it is actually quite less than 10 whereas hafnium dioxide is is 19 19 to 30 right so if i use something which has a high dielectric constant you know so this thing will polarize more when i apply uh, an electric uh, field and it can deposit more charges right so it is easy at the same voltage it can polarize more and deposit more charges so there is more field effect by having a high k dielectric as a gate oxide okay. that allows you to miniaturize the transistors even to smaller extents and so on and so forth we do not go there, but you know so, so there is this idea of high k dielectric which you know hafnia is a very good material uh, that is used as a high k dielectric, but it is high k in not visible light frequency right. So, it is high k at frequencies you know so which are less than megahertz or you know uh, uh, probably even close to gigahertz right. So, so it is high k in that frequency range that is ok, but if I go to terahertz and you know visible frequencies this is not high k right. So, so the, the k immediately drops the epsilon r immediately drops right. So, there seems to be some frequency dependence for the epsilon right. So, for the dielectric constant. So, to understand what this frequency dependence is well, we let us let us look at you know so how the dielectric constant comes about from an atomistic picture right. So, so we said that uh, uh, you know so okay if I take you know so for an atom like diamond right. Uh, so, diamond has a set of carbon atoms. Uh, so, this is a very covalent material right. So, I have you know all these carbon atoms there are nuclei uh, so there is a nucleus a positively charged nucleus and you have negatively charged electrons right. So, which are all orbiting around, but you know initially to start with whatever be the model I have a covalent there is going to be a covalent bond etcetera uh, in all these atoms whatever be the model that I consider the positively charged uh, nucleus and the negatively charged center of electrons right. So, positive and negative egg, the centers of positive charge and centers of negative charge coincide So, I can assume that the positive charge is a point charge because that is nuclear charge right. So, positive charge is a point charge whereas, negative charge is completely surrounding that that is all this you know cloud of electrons is my negative charge right. So, so let me use a different color. So, all this is my negative charge. So, the center of my negative charge is exactly the same as center of positive charge. So, so let me uh, you know so diamond to start with has 0 dipole moment right. 
So, so both centers of positive and negative charge I think you can see two colors there. So, that gives me 0 dipole moment P equal to 0 ok. So, for one atom same similarly for all the other atoms P 1 equal to 0, P 2 equal to 0 and so on and so forth ok. Now, I apply electric field. What happens when I apply electric field? The center of the so the, the nuclear charge right so which is the positive charge which is the red charge and the center of negative charge which is just this electron cloud right. So, electron cloud sort of stretches right compared to the positive charge right. So, so positive charge if I assume it to be fixed and not moving then the electron cloud surrounding this positive charge is sort of you know so goes in such a way that the center of negative charge uh, uh, you know goes up or goes down right. So, so depending on the direction of the electric field. So, now what I have done is uh, you know so I have applied uh, an electric field in this direction right. So, I split the center of positive and negative charges. So, this is at an electronic level I am just moving the electronic cloud away from nucleus and then once I remove the field it comes back right. So, uh, so, so I create a polarization at an atomic level and that polarization is just uh, you know the dipole moment that is how much the center of positive charge has separated from the center of negative charge times the charge right. So, 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 so that is that is essentially I have created a polarization at an atomic level right. And this polarization this atomic polarization of every atom. So, every atom is sort of polarized. Uh, so, polarized this way right. So, every atom gets polarized let us draw the polarization of every atom uh, ok. So, let us uh, sorry. So, every atom I have all these are my carbon atoms in diamond every atom the nucleus is separated from the the center of the negative electronic cloud that surrounds the nucleus right. So, so every atom is polarized in an electric field right. So, that is that is sort of the atomistic picture that I am looking at and this polarization hence should depend on the electric field this is the effect again this is the cause and the uh, you know the atomistic property that you know determines how much every atom is polarized is what is called polarizability alpha e is the alpha e I will write it as alpha e polarizability. And this polarizability comes from electronic clouds sloshing around right. So, so if I apply some sort of an AC field this electronic cloud exactly is at the center of the nuclear cloud right and then you know so the electronic cloud sloshes up and down up and down up and down right. So, 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 so the the the, the pole uh, you know so, uh, uh, so the polarizability alpha e is nothing but it is uh, uh, it is what is called electronic flow polarizability because it is the electronic clouds that are moving up and down compared to the nucleus right. So, this is electronic polarizability ok. Now, in an atom in a in a very covalent material like diamond where I do not have any other forms of polarizability I will explain what the other forms of polarizability are. So, uh, if I have n such diamond atoms per unit volume right. So, everything is getting polarized by alpha e times e right. So, this gives me the total polarization per unit volume right and uh, you know p equal to you know chi times e. So, uh, so chi epsilon naught times e. So, essentially chi epsilon naught is equal to n alpha e ok or you know so I have uh, chi plus 1 epsilon naught equal to epsilon right. So, the dielectric constant sorry epsilon r sorry chi plus 1 is just epsilon r not epsilon naught. So, that will be chi plus 1 epsilon r will be n alpha e by uh, epsilon naught plus 1 right. So, so this is 
this is the relation between atomistic polarizability right so the polarizability and the macroscopic property right so here i am looking at two different responses one is an atomistic response alpha e okay divided by epsilon naught plus 1 that gives me a macroscopic response if everything is hunky dory right so everything is hunky dory means i just have these electronic polarizabilities and you know every atom is polarizing to the same extent alpha e is the same for every atom etc uh, and so on and so forth right so so this is a very simple relation that relates the atomistic response to the macroscopic response and epsilon r is my macroscopic property i'm just measuring epsilon 1 epsilon r for the entire material right but alpha e can keep changing right so actually it is supposed to be alpha e over a unit volume right so divided by epsilon not plus 1 right over a unit volume okay so alpha e can keep changing from unit cell to unit cell that's okay right so then this is the more uh, generic formula But in diamond where you know so all atoms are identical you can, you can assume alpha e for all the atoms is going to be similar. So, it is it is a matter of n uh, alpha e by epsilon naught ok. So, ok. So, what we have seen so far is what is called electronic polarizability. ok. That is the so when I apply an electric field the the electron cloud sloshes around right. So, so there is there is an electronic polarizability that comes up and that is the property that will relate to the, your macroscopic dielectric constant ok. So, so that is the origin of dielectric constant uh, from an atomistic point of view ok. Now, I go to you know more sort of uh, you know uh, slightly more complex materials not diamond, diamond is completely covalent ok. So, the only form of polarizability that diamond has is electronic polarizability. Now, I look at you know sodium chloride right. Sodium chloride is an ionic material. I do not need to look at sodium chloride, I can even look at some other material like uh, uh, you know so, so something which is sort of you know more uh, um, uh, there is a bit of ionicity and bit of covalency right. So, so, so the bonding is not purely covalent right. So, there is a bit of ionicity and bit of covalency and you will find many materials which have such sort of bonding ok. Now, in NaCl ok. So, when I apply an electric field, so what I have I have a simple model for NaCl, I have ions now which are separated like this right. So, these are ions ok, ok, but if I zoom into every ion if I if I just zoom into this ion let us say there is you know again an atomic structure there right. So, with positively charged nucleus and negatively charged electronic cloud right. So, one electron is missing one electron has gone here, but in general you know so, so there is there is a positively charged nucleus and negatively charged ions right. So, that is every uh, every atom or every ion has an electronic structure associated with it and there is on the top of it at a at a more coarser level there is an ionic uh, you know arrangement right. So, uh, so, so the the finer or zoomed up picture I have an atomistic picture which is a nucleus plus electronic cloud that I have. If I go a bit more coarse grained I have ionic charges in the form of bonds, these are just valence bonds right. So, so these are uh, you know uh, uh, just chemical bonds right. So, nothing to do with single atom, but this is between two atoms right. So, I have some sort of ionicity, I can assume that this is positively charged, this is negatively charged and they are bonded by an ionic bond right. So, this is at a atomic level, this is at a unit cell level or this is at a bonding level right. So, so this is one atom. Uh, right. So, this is sub angstroms, this is you know unit cell level right. So, so this sort of uh, thing exists at unit cell level charge distribution. Now, when I apply an electric field, of course, there is going to be electronic polarization 
which means the electronic cloud right. So, so the uh, is going to slosh around right. So, so every you know uh, let me put it this way. So, there is going to be an electronic dipole moment inside an atom right in addition right I have all these dipoles here right. So, so there is also going to be these ions right. So, so I apply an electric field like this the positively charged ion will actually move as a whole right uh, in the direction of the electric field. So, the positively charged ion moves this way the negatively charged ion moves this way is that correct. So, negatively charged ion uh, yeah so positively charged ion moves uh, you know uh, in the direction of electric field and negatively charged ion moves opposite to the direction of electric field right. So, the ionic dipole moments are also created right. So, let us say there is uh, and as a result of this you know so I am, I am creating some sort of ionic polarization this is coming from bonds or bond polarizations ok. And I can associate a corresponding polarizability right. So, which is called ionic polarizability right. So, all right. So, if I look at NaCl then right. So, so by applying an electric field ok. So, uh, the, the nucleus moves away from electrons or a nucleus and electronic cloud separation in addition there is also going to be this bond distortions right. So, the positive and negative come close to each other uh, uh, the other positive and negative come close to each other right. So, so there is there are going to be this if I am applying electric field in this direction let us say right. So, uh, so, so there are going to be bond polarizations, polarizations coming from a bond level right. So, so a, a larger length scale polarizations coming from bonds right. So, bond polarizations or this is what is called ionic polarization. So, if I apply an electric field the polarization right the net polarization comes because of electronic polarization and ionic polarization right. So, both of them exist right. So, so both of them exist at different length scales, but both of them are polarizing my material. So, I have to uh, you know look at the total polarization as ionic polarization plus electronic polarization right and I can I can give this you know. So, some sort of an n uh, alpha i uh, you know by epsilon naught plus 1 you know plus n alpha e by epsilon naught plus 1 that those sort of uh, you know. So, so, I can I can explain what is the total polarization this is n 1 this is n 2 probably ok. So, uh, uh, ok so, so that will give me my epsilon r right. So, my dielectric constant is now dependent on both ionic polarization as well as electronic polarization. Now, let me uh, you know uh, 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 let me think of other materials. So, so, so the other material that comes to mind is water right. Now, in water of course, I have bonds right. So, so something like this. So, all these are so, so these are all water molecules which are all aligned in you know sorry H 2 O. So, O H H these are all aligned in different directions right. So, so O H H and so on and so forth and every water molecule has of course, there is an electronic polarization there is ionic polarization between these bonds right. So, so all of them exist, but every water molecule has some you know so some net because you know. Uh, uh, there is there is a lone pair of uh, electrons here right. So, so water is what is called a polar solvent 
right every uh, you know so so this is the, this is there is more negative charge here and so there is more positive charge here so every water molecule will have some sort of a uh, a polar uh, a dipole moment right so which is in uh, you know which is in these directions right so so these are what are called orientational dipoles okay so so water mo if i look at just water molecules as a dipolar uh, solvent and look at the di the polarizations of every molecule every molecule is polarized you know it has a dipole moment in different directions right these are all not talking to each other if i have ionic polarizations all these dipole moments are talking to each other right if i change one the other one will change but here these are all sort of free nothing is interacting with each other okay now in this case if i apply an electric field right so this is electric field all these dipole uh, moments will talk to the electric field all the dipole moments all the external dipole moments sorry all the orientational dipoles do not talk to each other but rather would talk to external electric field. This is like a capitalistic system right. Where every individual has some individualistic uh, you know presence they are not really affected by the other individuals but you know overall they are affected by money or you know so so uh, so money is your external electric field everyone wants to maximize the money right so everyone wants to here in this case all these orientational dipoles want to align in the direction of the electric field if i am applying an electric field in this fashion right so these are orientational dipoles okay and that is another way in which water can get uh, some extra polarization right so polarization here in this case will be p electronic plus p ionic plus p what is called orientational okay now i take you know so now i am no longer looking at uh, single materials i i i join two materials right I have something like uh, a space charge or uh, I have what is called this is a p type material this is an n type material I have a p n junction here. In p n junction you know so I have you know so it, it is a configuration where I have positive ions here and negative ions here right so, so this is the description of a p n junction in the junction I have charges right so, so these are what are called space charges right and the space charges just because these are there is a different charge distribution right so I have a dipole moment a dipole moment goes from uh, negative to positive okay. So, I have a, a, a space charge a driven dipole moment. Now that also would respond to an external field right. So, I can have you know p space charge. So, polarization then will be polarization electronic, polarization ionic, space charge if there is some orientational uh, you know polarization that will be there right. So, in general the way a material can get polarized right. So, the way a material can get polarized has multiple mechanisms ok. So, it is electronic if I list out all the ways in which materials can get polarized I have ionic polarization polarizability right. So, so this is polarizability right. So, it comes from these are the atomistic properties right. So, electronic polarizability ionic polarizability dipolar uh, the alpha e the alpha i uh, instead of calling it dipolar I will call it orientational polarizability that is alpha uh, you know o. Uh, then I have space charge based polarizability 
that is alpha uh, space charge alpha s right. Then I have you know if I have a ferroelectric polarization right. So, there can be ferroelectric charge that also responds to electric field that is alpha f right. So, I have all these different ways in which a material can get polarized upon the application of an electric field. These are all the atomistic ways in which a material can get polarized upon application of electric field ok. Now, comes the you know. Now, let us say I have uh, you know so, so let us go back to the example of p n junction where I have all these static charges right. So, so I have uh, uh, this is p this is n. So, what I have are positive charges here and what I have are negative charges here right. On this I shine light light is what is light? Light is an electric field that is varying at a frequency of 10 power 15 hertz right uh, 2 pi omega is 10 power 15 hertz rather not omega itself uh, to sorry omega by 2 pi is 10 power 15 hertz, but frequency of light is actually 10 power 15 hertz right visible light. Now, ok if I ignore the generation of charge carriers etcetera just by applying light just by applying an electric field which is oscillating at 10 power 15 hertz or 10 power 15 times per second I do not do anything to this uh, uh, to this depletion region right. So, so the charges remain as if they are they have not seen the light uh, as if they are not seeing the electric field right. So, if the electric field is you know electric field in visible light does not have any effect on space charge polarization. In general right, so if I have some sort of a polarization and you know so, so I want this polarization to oscillate with respect to electric field right. So, I have pol uh, I have some sort of a dipole moment and this dipole moment uh, p should you know. So, if I if I uh, if I apply an electric field an electric field is oscillating I want the dipole moment also to oscillate with respect to the electric field right in phase with the electric field you know, if it is an ideal capacitor right. But you know so, so if I and then you know so I play this game right. So, I am like uh, uh, I want I want to train you on something right. So, I say ok so, so we both are get, uh, training on uh, running right. So, on an ath athletic track right initially you know uh, uh, so this is how we train kids for example so initially i run slow and the kids starts running with me right so so we keep pace right good then i increase my pace and the kid you know also wants to increase his pace or her pace right so so i keep on increasing my pace or you know so i can cheat because i'm your coach right so i use a cycle and i say you run along with the speed of the cycle so so then the uh, you know uh, if if you are if you are going to be a good athlete you want to keep up with me right. Then I use a car and I say you run with the uh, with me uh, you know so, so I am driving car at certain speed. So, you run with the car right so, 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 so that you can increase your speed right. So, so I keep on increasing the speed at which my electric field is oscillating right. So, I keep on increasing the speed at which the uh, the forcing function which is me uh, you know forcing you to run uh, is increasing right. So, so then you know after a while right. So, if I if I make it quite unreasonable right. So, if I if I uh, if I go on Vande Bharat express which is traveling at 100 kilometers per hour and I ask someone to run at that speed even Usain Bolt can do that right. So, so you just give up right. So, uh, uh, so similarly you know so, so, uh, so certain polarizations right. So, so for example, the space charge gives up when I apply an electric field which is oscillating at 10 power 15 hertz right. So, nothing happens to space charge right. So, so electric field is not going to drive the space charge polarization along with it ok. So, at 10 power 15 hertz, but if I apply an electric field at very low frequencies 1 hertz or something then along with the electric field the space charge polarization can keep on you know moving around ok. So, similarly if I uh, you know if I have some sort of an orientational polarization water molecules they are all oriented in different fashions right. If I uh, if I just shine visible light right. So, I am not going to align this orientational polarization of the water molecules or I am not going to make the orientational polarization follow 
the electric field if I apply visible light. Whereas, if I apply uh, you know an electric field of frequency 10 hertz or 10 kilohertz right, then the water molecules orientational polarization actually follows the electric field. It is it is a reasonable thing for the orientational polarization to follow. After a while it just gives up, it says ok I cannot follow you do whatever you want, it is as if you do not exist right. So, so whatever is happening there is beyond my bandwidth right, so I cannot really follow that right. So, similarly ionic polarization it will follow the electric field only at up to a certain frequency right. So, ionic polarization in, in fact follows the uh, applied electric field up to terahertz frequencies right. But if I shine visible light right nothing happens to this ionic polarization right. Uh, but electronic polarization electronic polarization follows you know so even visible light will keep uh, you know oscillating uh, you know my my at uh, my electron cloud up and down right. So, so as a result you know so I have these so, I, I shine visible light uh, when you know where the electric field is oscillating at 10 power 15 hertz uh, and then that interacts with my material right. So, and uh, at an atomic level and then at an atomic level my electron cloud is sloshing up and down at the frequency of the visible light it is being driven right. So, at that frequency. So, so that is that is a dipole which is oscillating and if a dipole is oscillating that emits its own light right. So, so that is the light that is the light matter interaction and then this oscillating dipole emits its own light which I am able to you know measure and detect right. So, electronic polarization can follow the visible light, but now I, I uh, up my game right. So, I have to bring in Vande Bharat right. So, for electronic polarizability to give up and not follow I use x-rays for example. If I put in x-rays then electronic polarizability says no way man I am not going to follow you right. So, so I am I am slower than you know so how fast the x-rays are the electric field in x-rays is changing its uh, uh, its frequency uh, sorry uh, uh, yeah so so how fast the electric field uh, in x-rays is changing right so so that's uh, uh, that's in 10 power 18 or uh, you know so so you can you can actually calculate the frequency uh, so visible light is 500 nanometers whereas x-rays are uh, uh, you know 0.5 angstroms right so visible light is 500 nanometers and electronic polarizability works here follows uh, you know visible light which means right. So, this is 10 power 15 hertz whereas x-rays x-rays are at 0 0.5 nanometers excuse me. So, they are at 0 0.5 angstroms not nanometers right. So, so the, the x-rays that I find in lab they are about 0 0.5 ang uh, angstroms which is 0 0.05 nanometers. So, x-ray wavelength lambda x-ray is lambda visible divided by you know 100 times 100 right. So, so the divided by 10 power 4 as a result frequency uh, you know uh, omega x-ray is equal to 10 power 4 times omega visible. So, this will be at 10 power 19 hertz right not even 10 power 15 hertz. So, if the electric field is oscillating at 10 power 19 hertz, so in x-rays ok. Then not even electronic polarizability with respond, not even electronic polarizations or the property being polarizability will respond right. As a result if I actually look at dielectric constant which is an addition of all these different polarizabilities at very low frequency dielectric constant can be large right. Then some of these polarizations will give up right. Then in this you know so, so, so all polarizabilities are acting uh, all polarizabilities react to electric field here only some polarizabilities react here let us say you know some more give up right. So, and so on and so forth right. So, so it is it is going to be you know so that is why at low frequencies uh, omega equal to 10 kilohertz my half near has a dielectric constant of uh, you know 50. Uh, what did I say uh, 19 to 30, 
whereas I go to this visible light right, this is 10 power 15 hertz uh, omega equal to 10 power 15 hertz. So, so this can have ionic polarizability plus uh, you know uh, uh, what is it the the electronic polarizability, but at 10 power 15 hertz I, I get rid of the ionic polarizability epsilon r is going to be uh, I forget what the exact number is let us say 5, but I will correct myself tomorrow this is only given by electronic polarizabilities right. So, okay. so only electronic polarizability ionic polarizability is the bond uh, polarization stop following the electric field right. So, only electronic polarizability. So, as a result you know I have some frequency response right. So, epsilon r is related it has a frequency response right. So, which is going to look somewhat like this what happens in this intermediate regions right. So, when one mechanism starts to give up right is something that we will start seeing in the next class right. So, so, uh, so when polarization or polarizability polarizability mechanism start to give up okay, what happens in those frequencies. Right. So, so the I, I today I deliberately leave these gaps right. So, I am not sure what is happening here will it die will it just reduce like this or will there be something else that happens right. So, what happens here uh, you know so if I have one more regime what happens here right. So, so, uh, so this is until I go to visible frequency that is 10 power 15 hertz or x rays ok. So, not even 10 power 15, but this is uh, x rays right. So, uh, so anyway 10 power 15 hertz. So, what is happening at all these different uh, uh, you know gaps right. So, until I go to x rays which is 10 power 19 hertz that is what I am going to discuss uh, in the next class ok. So, so with that let us conclude this class uh, at this moment and uh, you know so, so we were trying to look at the dynamics of epsilon right. Uh, and then I started by saying it is it is going to be frequency dependent for a measurement small signal measurement I used one frequency. So, I got I get the capacitance or dielectric constant at that frequency right, but when I actually uh, you know look at the frequency response it is not necessary that the dielectric constant is it is not indeed true that the dielectric constant is the same across all frequencies that is not true there is always what is called frequency dispersion right. So, so the, this this phenomena is what is called frequency dispersion we understood why that should exist because there are some mechanisms that uh, play at low frequencies that sort of give up once you go to higher frequencies. So, uh, so now the, the question is you know so in the next class we will continue on this uh, asking what is going to happen at this intermediate frequencies where the one mechanism is about to give up right. So, it did not give up yet but when I mean it is about to give up right. So, we have this beautiful phenomena called relaxation and uh, resonance that happens uh, we will we will actually see uh, you know so uh, what happens ok. Uh, so, with that let us conclude this class and I will see you again in the next class.